Ya. <laughs> Alright, so let's start. I'm quite glad you visited. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Alright, class, welcome to uh, Intro to Philosophy, class number four, this is. And we're going to cover more metaphysics. Last class, we just kind of had the introduction of metaphysics, and this one we're going to get deeper into that world and look at the Socratic solution. All right, so first, let's have um, Granty here introduce us. It's Naomi again. One. I don't remember if we had this specific one for a class. I don't or know if we, if we did, did for the, I think, I think yeah. so. I think this is a repeat. Yes. But I had a horrible day and I needed to pick me up. Yeah. <laughs> that picks you up really quickly. And then you can do a lot of things and have a lot of ideas. <laughs> a lot of things all at once. All right. All right. So we ended last class by um, talking about the, I guess, the main question, the problem of change, and really Parmenides and Heraclitus' division in that, and um, and the comprehension of change as always encompassing the sense of non-being, right? Yes. And the sense of nothingness. And we got into a pretty good discussion on, on the idea of nothingness and why it is such a complicated idea for, um, for any description of being at all because it's precisely the, the lack it's of non-being, being. Non-being, yeah. Yeah, that, that, um, that nothing is. Oh, they're pulling wheelies. So let, let's do a cheers before we start. Oh, please, please, please. You know, when I lived, um, when I lived out, out in Europe, in Italy, I don't remember how you say it in Italian, but basically, if you don't do cheers, they say something horrible, like, I hope your mother dies a horrible death or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's like super offensive not to do salute with them. Okay, I'll remember that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, have you ever read a little bit of, uh, I guess, the Socratic and Platonic uh, world? In terms of its solution to the problem of change? No, we've talked about it, but I haven't. I haven't yeah, you haven't. Yeah, you yeah, haven't. Yeah, yeah. But you've encountered it at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so um, for, for Plato, and so one thing to keep in mind for the students, um, Socrates never wrote anything. And so Plato it, recorded. Yes, Pla yeah. Plato wrote everything. And it's always, um, yeah, written in persona of, uh, of the dialogue that Socrates had with other people. Another thing to keep in mind is that with ancient texts, it, it, it isn't supposed to be um, like a historically accurate depiction of reality. It isn't as if somebody was walking around writing down every step that he took. These narratives are intended to be narratives and they're, they're intended to give a, a larger truth of the Socratic method, the Socratic ideas, more so than it's supposed to be an actual historical account in the conversations that they had. Mm -hmm. And that's something to really keep in mind because some of these conversations most likely never even happened. Mm -hmm. But it's just that he is presented in story form and narrative form w of the person of Socrates in order to explicate the ideas of the Socratic world um, and his solution to the problem of change. And um, when we get past uh, the Socratic world, we're probably going it, to... It's almost hard not to talk about the Aristotelian solution mm -hmm. because that is uh, the finality of the Platonic world um, mm -hmm. for the solution of problem change. So, so, so to get into it, Socrates, uh, just to get a little bit into the narrative, so when you're reading the text, you could kind of um, comprehend what's happening. He, was, uh, he visited an oracle, and she told him that he's going to be the wisest of all the men. And he didn't want to believe the oracle. He says, no, I'm not. And so basically, many of these dialogues is him searching for somebody that is wiser than he is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that's why he goes to the Mino. He, he, he talks to him. He, he talks to uh, Euthyphro and Credo. He talks to a lot of different people. And each one of them is supposed to be experts of their field, like mm -hmm. an expert lawyer or, or, or a expert... Um, uh, understanding of piety and, and that like that. that um kind of the endeavor to find someone who's more intelligent than him or wise or whatever mm -hmm. was that something that literally happened or is that just kind of how the narratives just how the narrative goes yeah, yeah okay now, right. whether that actually happened i mean or not. totally could have but yeah thousands of years out you don't know right yes and so um and so he, he goes around and, and tries to discuss with his people and so for for socrates he he kind of intuited that there is that somehow the solution to this problem of change, the problem of, of, of change and then the problem of permanence is that they both must exist at least epistemically um, 
in the world. Mm -hmm. And so he had what is called the divided theory of knowledge. Do you mean exist epistemically in that they are real in that we can perceive them? Meaning that, um, and and we'll get to it a little bit later, but uh, one of the final texts that Plato wrote in in the conversation is called Parmenides. Mm -hmm. And in that text, it is a young Socrates presenting the world of forms, the theory of forms to Parmenides, and then Parmenides um, objecting to it and saying what the flaws are. And in that, Socrates kind of says, well, maybe he didn't mean that they're ontologically real, but they're only real epistemically, like in in ideas, right? Uh, and, And so whether they're ontological realities or not, I think is still up to debate, at least with the early work. But, um, but, uh, but if you look at the finality of the work, it was more epistemic than anything else. Okay. And so the one thing that, that he was able to observe is that we, that it is, with the Heraclitian worldview is something that is truly incomprehensible. <laughs> what happened? You said Heraclitian and then Joe and I like looked at each other. <laughs> Oh no! Oh. I said, <laughs> you said Herac- yeah. <laughs> you said Heraclitian. Heraclitian. You said Clidian really loud. And then yes. I looked at Joe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So the Heraclitian. So it's a, so the the Heraclitian view that everything is change and flux. Yeah. And this is truly incomprehensible because when we when we think of of an object, we always think of his permanent state. What is the mm-hmm. permanent reality? This is, for example, how we, be, how we understand categories. Mm-hmm. Because if you were to look at every leaf, for example, every leaf in existence, there is not one leaf that has identical properties to another one. There are accidents in their properties that distinguish one leaf to the other. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you have many different types of trees, many different types of leaves. Mm-hmm. But we're we, we able to abstract the permanent qualities or the essential properties that make a leaf a leaf mm-hmm. And from there, we could categorize all of these things, whether they're long, skinny, like pine leaves, or whether they're f- huge, fluffy, like, needles. you know, fluffy. Pine ne- leaves? Yes. They're, ne- <laughs> they're needles. It's fine. Pine trees don't have leaves. Were there leaves on pine trees? Okay. Yes, but they're leaves. I think botanically they're considered leaves. Yeah. But, yeah, anyway. but they're still leaves, yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, but the pipe of pine trees have leaves. So he's actually yes. okay. Yes. Sorry, sorry. So he's breaking down your theory of categories. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Attempting to. Attempting to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and so you so you have the, the, these things that look dramatically different, right? The same thing if you just want to take dogs. You have a Chihuahua, for example, yeah. and they have a Great Dane. There's so many accidental qualities that they simply don't share. Height, one of them. Weight, aggression, temperament. Um, all, all these things they, they really don't share, but we still categorize them as dogs because they have these central properties. Mm-hmm. And so there's permanent qualities in each one of these categories in, in order for us to um, to categorize it as such. And so it's it's important uh, that that uh, that, that um, Socrates w- was able to realize is that without that it would simply be be chaotic and knowledge would never arise. Like, we cannot arise... There is no knowledge if you can't categorize things. Right, if you can't categorize things, and if you cannot... Uh, extrapolate at least similarities extrapolate, yes, things. Extrapolate, yeah. yes, yeah. And understand the permanence of its state of reality. And so, um, and so he has this divided theory of knowledge, basically, that it, it, it first begins with images. Mm-hmm. And with images, in order for an image to be an image at all, it, there is something that it is imitating. And so, like, for, for example... A sculpture of a man, mm-hmm. um, a sculpture of a man is a representation of, of, of men, right, yeah. of, of, of humans. And so there, there's an actual human, then there's a representation of the human. Yeah. And that's what a painting is, that's what a sculpture is, that's what any kind of art form is, mm-hmm. or a description in a novel. These things are representing um, something that is real, something that, uh, something that is actual. And so he says, you know, imagery has a certain state of epistemic reality mm-hmm. that, that we could comprehend things through images. Uh, th- there's that famous painting that says, you know, this is not a pipe yeah. in the bottom of it. That, that's basically what he's trying to get at. It's yeah. because it's, it's a depiction of a pipe, but it's not, a, it's not an actual pipe. It's just simply a, a representation of mm-hmm. a pipe. And so, um, so imagery in general is, is basically, he's a, it's, a for, it's a lowest form of knowledge, but it's still a form of knowledge mm-hmm. because it is representing something that is real. It's kind of like a dream-like It is, yeah, knowledge. yeah. And so um, f- 
from there, he says, well, the next, next level of knowledge is the object in which imagery represents. And so the actual interacting with human beings, you know, your, your empirical understanding of things, interacting with a dog, is much more, you gain much more knowledge with interacting with a dog than just simply conceptualizing, yeah. um, uh, imagining a painting of a dog or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so um, he says, it's just that, 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 is, that is where um, the realm of what he calls belief. Because he says, in this realm is where Heraclitus wants to stay. He wants to stay in the realm of belief. The difficulty with empirical information is precisely that they are always changing. So, so for example, if you were to pick a biology book from 30 years ago, m m maybe 50%, 60% of the information will be outdated. Mm -hmm. uh, because empirical knowledge necessarily is always in a realm of belief. There's always in a process of becoming. You get more information, yeah. things change, and whatever. So nothing is constant, really, in empirical evidence. While in um, other evidence, uh, other forms of knowledge, like mathematics, which is, which is going to be... There's a giant uh, duck. All yes. right. <laughs> that is. <laughs> that was a shocking thing to see drive by. <laughs> Should go out there with a the camera. No. Um, giant inflatable duck. Yeah, just leave it to mystery, yeah. And so, um, All right. <laughs> that's hard. It, it is quite large. It shocked um, me. It's like yeah. 15, 16, 17 yes. foot tall. Duck. And so, um, and so again, if you look at, uh, at mathematics, you could pick a math, uh, 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 an arithmetic book from 2000 years ago yeah. and the information will be permanent. It'll be the same. And so he says, this is why when you go into realm of math, um, or logic and, mm -hmm. and ordinary thing. These things are of more, uh, I guess, absolute knowledge than empirical knowledge. Empirical knowledge is still belief, while mathematics, you're getting to closer to what it means to know something. Now, the, the finality of this is the forms. So he says the forms are basically all the things that we call abstraction mm -hmm. or categories that we can Com begin to begin to comprehend something to know something to know its form mm -hmm. for 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 example when you teach a child that you know the f not all four-legged animals are dogs that there's cats there's goats there's sheep there's you know horse you whatever. said to know something is to know its form yes to know something to know, its form. to know that in which it's being participates yes. essentially well, yeah okay. And so that becomes the final category in which you ab actually gain knowledge once you understand the form of, uh, of the thing. And so, for example, if you were to simply draw a triangle on a board mm -hmm. or whatever, um, the triangle is not, comp you know, me perceiving the triangle is not really comprehending what it means to be a triangle. That's only simply in the realm of imagery because mm -hmm. I drew something. And so what is the triangle representing? The triangle is representing a concept of a three-sided close plane figure. This is what, what is representing. And so any, any particular triangle that I encounter in the world is never triangularity itself. It's simply a representation of a triangle, while the form of the triangle is a definition of what it means to be a triangle. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing with, with, with any category. If, if you have dogs, you know, what, is the, what, what are the essential qualities that make a dog? That is the form of doghood, or, for example. Yeah. What is it that makes humans? That is the form of man. A yeah. and, un and understanding the form of man allows you to know what each individual human um, is. And so understanding to know something is to know its form. And these categories that we begin to discover, he would say, you know, this is what is more true. Mm -hmm. and so in a way, he's also appealing to Parmenides because Parmenides says that there is a permanence to reality that changes an illusion. So he's saying that Parmenides is going too far. It isn't the case that changes an illusion. It is a changes a, a state of belief. It's in a state of empirical knowledge, mm -hmm. which can never really become knowledge itself. It will always be mere belief. And so he doesn't want to go to the extreme where things are simply... Um, uh, illusory, but he also doesn't doesn't want to go to um, Heraclitus extreme that all there is is change and flux. So why is change just a belief in mm -hmm. Socratic thinking? Is it because, because it's... It, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of how I would explain that, because I think I know why. Yeah. It's because uh, there really is no form to it. Exactly. Change has yeah. no form, therefore you can't really yeah, there, know there's, it. There's, yeah, there's nothing it's, really it's to be It's merely known. just kind of a concept. Yes, really. It's a concept yeah. of our experience, and that's yes. why he views it. Okay. So he, so he thinks maybe 
and this is where where many different theories about the platonic world of forms comes about like is it is there a real realm is there a third realm of reality that is simply formhood mm -hmm. right and and i mean i think that's debatable whether he actually believes that or not but he does believe at least in epistemic level that nothing can be known if it were not for forms nothing can be known if it were not for permanence in reality so just for, for just to kind of go on a tangent a mm -hmm. little bit like what's yeah. what's something without a form other than change that one cannot know nothing the concept of nothing yeah okay yeah there's no form to that has no yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's just change yeah just just change <laughs> no no okay so it's a it's merely yes. just conceptual it which is, doesn't yeah. mean well it means it's not real Exactly. So, 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 so change you're, is you're not getting into Parmenides' okay. objections to okay, it. Okay, yeah. okay, 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 yeah. okay, okay. And so I mean, this is just simply the broadest form I'm, of I'm, metaphysics. I'm like kind of wading around in this right now. So I'm yeah. kinda... No, no, I think, <laughs> I think it's interesting that you're actually coming up with, uh, yeah, with the same Because you were about to go yeah. that direction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, the, um, and so th there's a few complications with this. And so um, what's, what's interesting is, that, you know, th this is the, the theory that Plato put out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, like I said, the last work, he actually begins to object to the Socratic forms. And so the way he does it is he puts a narrative of young Socrates and, um, and Parmenides is giving a presentation yeah. on, um, on why change is an illusion. And then there's his, um, his student and his lover, Zeno, that is giving a mathematical explanation of this. So if you ever hear like Zeno's paradox, so Zeno's paradox is, is for example, that motion can never really be, be had. Because in order for, for example, let's say that you have object, this object right here is moving from point A to point B. So in order for this object to move from yes. point A to point B, it has to cross at least half its yes. point. Yes. But in order to cross that half point, it has to cross that half point. Yes. In order to cross that half point, it has to cross, cross that half point, and that goes on to infinity, right? And that, since that goes on to infinity... He has something to say. At infinitum. The archer Yeah, the archer one. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. That the arrow action. Do you have travels. anything to say about that, really quick? While we, since you've mentioned, yeah, it? Uh, about that. I mean, it, it conceptually and rationally speaking, if you are going to comprehend change as a derivation of being from non-being or from non-being to being, um, then yeah, that does make sense. Mm -hmm. Because if change is simply the only way that change occurs is because this is not in point mm -hmm. A then yes, you necessarily would have to cross that point. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this is, this is why yes, we're going to get to yes, Aristotle's yes. We're, solution. We're, we're going we're gonna to talk about why that's yes, yeah. not complete. Yes, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah, just, just reset it, yeah. Sweet. Begin, yeah, do that one. And Next. so, yeah, there's, um, so yeah, and, and it is an interesting, uh, because I, I think that example you gave is like, who's going to win the race, Hercules, or... Or the, tur t t uh, the, the turtle, the turtle, yeah, the turtle. The and then in the end, he says, "Well, there was never motion to be had. Yeah. For motion is simply uh, a mere illusion." I just wanted everything to be an illusion. I know, yeah. yeah. What, 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 what we're going to notice with uh, with the progression of philosophy yeah. or lack thereof is that whenever they run into a complication, many people pull out what I call the illusion card. And so they don't want to really... It's just an illusion. Yeah, they don't want to comprehend it. So, so, so like in the con contemporary times, you would see this with someone like Sam Harris who simply say, well, a consciousness is a, a mere illusion. There, 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 there is no... Yes, there, there, is no um, there is no self. There is no consciousness. It's simply illusory. You, you see this in many times all over the place. You see it with quantum physics. Right? Well, yeah. you know, this universe as being the only one is simply an illusion. There's string theory or multiverse theory and so on and so forth. And so, um, yeah, you, you, you would see that many, many thinkers have the illusion card always ready at hand when they run into uh, something that kind of goes against It essentially dissuades any kind of thought. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can't prove it, don't try. Like, yeah, oh, okay. pretty much, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, it, it's even worse like when you go to um, Bertrand Russell when he says, well, then everything's merely a brute fact. It needs no evidence, but anyways, and so yeah. we, we, we'll get to we'll get to all of that much later on. But 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 just keep in mind that that is very common to for have these uh, to have thinkers pull out the illusion card even till today, when it's something that they don't want to explain. They say then it is something that is unexplainable. Was it par so is it Parmenides that was the illusory yes. change? They, were they, yeah, Parmenides said illusory and change, but Heraclitus says that permanence is an illusion. 
that there so is, there's it, an illusion somewhere. Yeah, there is no illusion. That there right. is no real self. There is no constant self in reality. There's just change. Yeah. And so, so yeah, they both they both appeal to the illusion card. And this is where where um, Socrates or Plato didn't want to go. They didn't want to pull out the illusion card. But when, when we get to it, um, yeah. the logical end really would be well, which one is more real, the world of forms or the world of change? Yeah. Right. And and this is where where he presents it. Yeah. All right. So um, now. Heracli- I, I'm sorry. So after presenting like the Zeno's paradox and everything, and this happens in, in contemporary academia as well. Normally when you give a certain lecture, you have afterwards a question period. And so then, you know, if, if you watch this on YouTube, you can see it with many academics, you can see it with, with invited guests at a university. Mm-hmm. And so people like go up and they start asking questions. And so th- this is the time that, um, that he begins to, that, that the young Socrates wants to come in and ask questions about um, about this uh, about about his theory of change being an illusion, mm-hmm. and so the first thing he does is that he obviously goes up there and then he he presents his world of forms basically. Well, then you know why wouldn't it be the case that there is a permanence in reality? That the permanence of reality is a world of forms in which instantiates every particular case of. Uh, uh, of change mm-hmm. and so for example if you if you if we go back to the triangle example so when you think of um think of a triangle y- that there's some kind of instantiating power once you c- could conceptualize the form of triangularity that that you can form any kind of triangle that you want to the moment you understand that a triangle is a three-sided close plane figure mm-hmm. and then i could make a right triangle. I can make, um, you know, any kind of triangle. A- any kind of triangle. Yeah. Equilateral triangle. You can make them huge, small. You could write it in sand. I could take like three objects like this and formulate a triangle. Because yes, and so now there's a triangle, right? It's a three-sided <laughs> close. <All> right. <laughs> yes. I can't. I can't imagine being a teacher with Joe in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I do, were you this disruptive to your professor or no? No. No. <laughs> so no, my mama would have kicked my ass. <laughs> no, no, I mean, in person, it's hard to be that disruptive. It's hard to get away with it. Yes. Yeah, we're not people. This yeah. isn't in person. Wow. <laughs> More things I have to cut out. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch it anytime you're like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> There's an yeah, asshole so there, in the background. <laughs> there was a crazy man here with no, no, super no, no, long hair. <laughs> I, it wasn't me. I'm not the asshole. <laughs> Jeremy, it's you. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> anyway. Oh, let, let me pour you some more wine. I love this Mayomi, man. This this might as well be the only wine I ever drink. It's amazing. I, I had it with ribeye the other day. Oh, my God. It's Which normally Pinot's not a steak wine. I know, but this one is. Yeah. <laughs> so spectacular. Ribeye and wine is like oh, I think of Argentinians. Is, yeah, yeah. Argen, yeah, I think Argentinos. of South Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Whitey. Oh my gosh! All right, so um, so now so now let's get to this. So he presents his world of forms. So 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 Socrates presents it as if the world of forms have some kind of instantiating power mm-hmm. again, because knowing the form means you know the particulars, and the for and the particulars in some way cannot exist, not in some way, in an absolute sense, cannot exist without its form. Mm -hmm. Without the form of triangularity, no particular case of triangle can ever exist. It necessarily can exist only insofar that you have a three-sided close plane figure. Um, And so when he presents this, uh, this is when Zeno kind of hands it off to Parmenides. So Parmenides comes in here and he begins to speak and he's going to show why the um, Socratic world is irrational. That there's there, there there's an issue with it, and so uh, in in order to understand the third man problem, there are uh, certain steps. You know, and so the first um, the first dilemma that Parmenides presents to him is called the part whole um, dilemma, and so the or the whole part dilemma. And so the whole part dilemma is um, so. Let me just read this qu- some of my notes really quick. So Parmenides is attempting to show the Socratic world of forms are, is absurd. Because individual objects having a form means that there are many forms, mm-hmm. necessarily. And so if there's a form of triangularity, for example, then there must be a form of square. 
And if there's a form of square, there must be a form of circle. If there's a form of circle, there must be a form of cat, a form of dog, a form of man. And so, so with that, necessarily, you're saying that there's a plurality to the world of forms. Um, and so if there is a plurality to the world of forms, you know, you can kind of see that where this is logically going. It's going to have the same complication of change that the word of particulars would have. So to clarify something you just said, like, 20 seconds ago. Yeah. You said for there to be a form of triangles, there must be a form of squares. Does yes. that mean, uh, would the more complete way to say that be because there is there is a form of triangles Yeah. and there are four-sided, closed, e- equal-sided plain figures, yes. plain, like figures that are not triangles, there must be a form that makes them squares. Yes. Because definitely. when you say there is a triangle, there must be a square, it's like, well, no. Not really. You don't right, have yes. to. Okay, I see. No, what you I mean. just. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. To clarify, it, it just that. It, Not it, to be pedantic, but. Right. Yeah. yeah. But because because necessarily, if there is a form of triangularity, mm-hmm. that means that form must be unique and distinct from any other shape. And so, if there are other shapes in existence, which I would, uh, I guess, I assume that that yeah. is known, right? Well, that there yes, are squares yes. and circles and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess circles but and axioms so be, more, more than uh, okay. Than so it's shape. it's. Just the way you worded it, something yes. like, because there are triangles, right, like there some, must be some kind of causal relation. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So I just was like, okay, yes. I, I, I want that worded differently. <laughs> yes, all right, yes, which would be helpful because for we're students. what we're talking about. Yeah, no, it's in important. any other context, who cares? Yeah, like, no, it's important. Yeah, and so he says that, that that's the first part of his complication. Yeah, so forms themselves will have similar complications of anything with plurality. For yeah. for remember, plurality exists in the what Parmenides would call in the illusion space of change because in order for this object to not be this object, it necessarily means that this has properties that this one does not and this has properties that this one does not. Does any, does, can and that be even just spatial? Yes, and could be even spatial. Okay. And so, and, and so that's why there can never be identical empirical objects. The, the, the word identical only really can refer to concepts. Like the, the, this concept is identical to this one. Um, and so, like, the, the solution of 2 plus 2 equaling 4 is identical to 3 plus 1 equaling 4. Yeah. That's, a, that's an identical um, answer to that because it's conceptual. So when you, when you say, like, these two coffee mugs are identical... They cannot be because... Not technically. Yes. Obviously, you could say that colloquially, but, like... Colloquially, yeah, but But, that's like, wrong. technically, it's not correct. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I would say just grammatically, and people shouldn't use language yes. of identicalness. Agreed. Yeah, to, Agreed, to, but... To, yes. Uh, because, it, then they, cause like, these two objects are... You know, they're both rooks, right? Yes. But there's since this is here and this is there, it can even really if be the literally same. every other property yes. of the rook even was the same. The fact that they don't occupy the only way they could be the same if you if they're the same, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, which yeah, was yeah. simply a singular object. Yeah. Which again will go Parmenides that there's only one state of being. Then yeah. there cannot be a plurality. So he says basically that Socrates is presenting what what is understood as a pie model of forms, mm-hmm. that the reality um, presents. The, the reality of the world of forms is both form and particular in, in itself. So let me read this really quick because this is a bit um, difficult to comprehend. I kind of want to use Parmenides' words more yeah, than Yeah, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> so it says, Now imagine that there, are one, that there are at one time three sensible F things, A, B, and C, each separate from one another. According to, the, according to causality, each of A, B, C is F by virtue of partaking of the F and hence, each ABC partakes of the F. Given the whole pi model, it follows that F is as a whole and in a single time in each A, B, and C. Thus, the whole of F is in A, the whole of F is in B, and the whole of F is in C. If A, B, and C are in separate places, then causality and the whole pi model together require that one and the same form be as a whole in separate places at the same time. And so here is where Parmenides concludes that in this picture, the relevant form would be separate from itself. And so it's absurd because the whole of the form, so yeah. form F, will be entirely within the part of A if A is a representation of that form. So let's say that the form of triangularity, and I have three different triangles, right? I have a triangle here, I have a triangle here, right? And I have a triangle here. Right there, right? <laughs> so here, here I have three triangles, A, B, and C. Yeah. Now, in order for this to be a triangle, it means that it must be partaking fully within the form of triangularity in this one. But which then is it, what you were saying was F. Right, was F. Okay. And so then 
if the form also has partaken in this one as a particular, and has also partaken in this one as a particular, but yet I am claiming that it is a whole, and so it is both part and whole at the same time, which is absurd. It cannot be both part and whole at the same time. It must either be the wholeness or must either simply be a part. Mm -hmm. And this only arises because you're saying that there's a particular world in which this form lives and behaves. And so that, that's the first dilemma that he presents, but that's not the finality. The, the finality is what is known as a third man problem. And so the way that this is presented is that, um, and, and you know, basically crudely many people present it as if, you know, if, if, if the world form exists and then what is the form of that form, right? Yeah. And that, that's in a crude way, but, but it's actually a little more um, calculated than this, it's a little more mathematically uh, and uh, logically presented. And so in order to understand this argument, there's three principles that, that he presents. One over the many, self-predication and, and non-identity. And so one of the many is that the particular things partake in one universal form, as we said. So each one of these triangul triangles partakes in the one universal form of mm -hmm. triangularity. Yeah. Self-predication means the qualities of the things. That, that the definition of triangularity is, uh, I guess, the existence of the form is self-predicated within this definition. So it's true by definition. Mm -hmm. And that's what self-predication means. And the last thing of non-identity, that no form is identical to anything that it partakes. And so, uh, that partakes of it. And so, this particular triangle cannot itself be the form. This is a representation of that form. Okay. And, and so, that, that's where, where, where um, it cannot partake in it. And so, now let me read from Parmenides again. And so, it says, consider a plurality of large things, A, B, and C. By, w by one over the many, there is a form of largeness. Call it L1. So the first form. So by virtue of partaking of A, B, and C are large. By self-predication, L1 is large. So there is now a plurality of large things, A, B, C, and L1. And thus, by one over the many, there is a form of largeness, call it L2. By virtue of partaking of which A, B, C, and L1 are large. Hence, L1 partakes of L2. At this point, uh, so, so, so at this point, Parmenides is assuming that there's some kind of... Um, Something like uh, the, you know, the principle of non-identity. And so now, now I've done this, and no form is identical to anything that partakes of it. And so, um, so from, from this is from the fact that L1 partakes of L2, non-identity entails that L2 is numerically distinct of L1. Thus, there must be at least two forms of largeness, L1 and L2. But this is not all. By self-predication, L2 is large, so there is now a new plurality of large things, L1, uh, I saw A, B, C, L1, and L2. Thus, by one over the many, there must be a form of largeness called L3. So by virtue of partaking of which A, B, C, L1, and L2 are large, hence L1 and L2 are both partakers of L3. By then, you know, basically this will go um, on ad infinitum. It's, it's just going to be infinity. Yeah. That it's just going to keep on producing more and more forms mm -hmm. because... In order for the form of triangularity to be the form of triangular triangularity, there are principles in which it is partaking, which is the definition of three-shotted close plane figure yeah. as a self-predication. But if that is the case, then this de definition in itself requires yet another definition. So what does, in what, or of what form does three-sided close pin figure-ness take? Yes, yeah. Okay. And that'll be form number two. And then yeah. that form now is within the categories and that needs form three. And, and so on and so forth. And so this goes into an infinite regress. And so Parmenides is simply saying that the reason why um, the Socratic world of forms falls apart mm -hmm. is precisely because you cannot claim that something universal is also plural. So there cannot be a plurality to um, universality. That, that that in itself inherently entails the state of non-being. Again, because in order for this to not be this, to have uh, two objects, there must it must necessarily be the case that this is not this in whatever capacity, yeah. right? Whatever accidental properties it has, it cannot be that object, and that's the only way you could ever have plurality. So, in itself, contains this concept of nothingness that we talked about last class, which is an incomprehensible term. It's a term without meaning, um, or at least no no direct meaning. It's only accidental meaning, meaning that that, that you know everything, and then you detract what it means for, for thinghood to be and then that's when you get nothing. All right, so, th so that, that is the, the complication that was presented into the Socratic world of forms. Now, today I want to end at least with the beginning of yeah. Aristotelian metaphysics. So, with, uh, so Aristotle was a student of Plato. Yes. And um, 
and he wants to take a step back because because basically if if we're functioning with this definition of change Parmenides is going to win logically. Yeah. There's no way to really dispute it. If change is truly the derivation of being from non-being or from a state of being to non-being, then Parmenides is, is correct. That the one thing that, that remains universal will be the state of being absolutely mm. unchanged. Change is being illusory. And change being an illusion. Now, this is something that Aristotle is not satisfied with because obviously... It's not. It's, yeah, we're still experiencing, right? Because somebody could tell me all day that change is an illusion. It doesn't mean that, therefore, I cease to experience change. Yeah. I'm still living in the world. So, so, the, so can you, can, as a human being, can you experience something that is not real? No. Okay. It's going to be real to a certain degree, okay. even if you're on LSD or whatever. Yeah. Whatever, whatever you're experiencing, it, there, there's a reality to it, right? Whether it's chemicals in a the brain, there has to be something that, that, that pertains to reality. In your experience, so you can't just say that the thing you experience isn't real in any capacity. Yes, because then you wouldn't yeah. be experiencing it. Yes, yeah, you wouldn't, wouldn't be experiencing, experiencing change. Yeah, you're experiencing right. something, okay. anyways. And so, what is that? It needs some kind of description, some kind of explanation. And so, Aristotle wants to take a step back, and he wants to say, well, the main problem actually is that we are accepting a faulty definition of change itself. Is it not working? Oh, maybe it's running out of it's space. It's like four, three, two, one. And it's like, I've already, yeah, recording canceled. Oh, really? So. Yeah, we're close to the end. Just do a wide shot. Just do the wide shot? Okay, Yeah, yes. whatever. Yeah. You, you uh, are the other shot. two cameras working at least? Yeah, this one's still, this yep. one's at 18, so I'm probably going to okay, reset that pretty soon. And this one says it's got 11 minutes left. Okay, good. And so, um, so Aristotle wants you to take a step back and say, well, there is a... There is an issue with what he's taking as change because one thing that he says is not true is that, well, if it is a, a state of transference of, of being to non-being or, or from um, non-being to being, mm -hmm. that one thing that we notice empirically, at least, is that things don't just change into whatever. Mm -hmm. It isn't as if I could plant a seed, uh, an acorn in the ground and a dog pops out of it. We know that an oak tree will come out of it. We can predict things. We, we, we can make very easily predictions. So like if, if, if a human... Um, female gets pregnant, you don't wonder whether it's a chicken or a yeah. pig. You know that it's going to be human. You, could, you can assume that it will be human, and, uh, and you can make a prediction uh, of what it will be. And so things don't just change into whatever. And so if things don't change into whatever, it's insufficient to describe change as merely a derivation of non-being. There has to be something in there that it contains being still consistently throughout change. Potentiality. Yes, and this is where he comes with potentiality. And this is going to be just a, a huge breakthrough within, um, within metaphysics in general and, and why Aristotelian metaphysics continues is going to be... Continues to be the most complete. Uh, yeah, it still continues to be the most complete. And yeah. even when people reject it epistemically, they don't reject it in practice. People still, yes, yeah. you can't really reject it in that way. And so he says change actually is not the derivation of being to non-being, that there's a third quality. The third quality is potentiality. That, that an object has both an actual state of being and there is the quality of non-being, but it says we don't even need to acknowledge that because that's nothing. Because right? they won't change into yeah, non-being. Yeah, right? because yeah. non-being is nothing. And yeah. so if with nothing, there's no reason to, acknowledge, to, to observe that. But there is something, another quality in it, which is what it could potentially be that it cannot just be whatever. There are inherent qualities in an object that can be actualized to another actual state of being. Yeah. It says th th this is getting closer to, to understanding change. And so what do we mean by that? So when we, uh, when we observe any object, we could ask four basic questions from it, right? What is the stuff that makes it? What are its predications? Where did it come from? And what is it for? If we ask those four questions, this is how we come to know a thing, whether it's man-made or just been out of the world. So let's take something that is man-made because we could find this teleology a lot easier, right? Mm -hmm. And so let, let's take this object right here. So you first ask, what is the stuff that makes it? Well, you could say it's wood. Okay, it's wood, but this is also wood, this is wood. So that's insufficient to know what this object is in totality. I just know that its, it's material reality is that it's made and has some felt in the bottom, right? Yeah. So we could talk. About, we, 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 could, we could talk about that thing. <laughs> there is right there. So it doesn't scratch up the board. 
as there's wine all over it. And like yes, I know. Yeah. yeah. At least it's not scratched. Yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so the next question you ask, what are, what are its predications? What are its forms? Mm-hmm. So it's predication. You could you could talk about its shape, right? It's a shape like a, what we know a, a castle thing yeah. to be, or at least a tower of a castle. It has pointy tops. It is what is it like one about two inches tall, um, about an inch thick, and so on. You so you could talk about all the other properties that 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 make it up. You could say it's brown um, and with red felt in the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so you could talk about all these qualities. Those are its predications. You know how how it exists. No, not so much. Um, the singularity of its material reality. And then you could ask where it came from. Well, this one was carved by a, a Chinese man, and, um, and it was hand-carved, so you could say that it was carved in China, shipped over here, and how did it get here? You know, it was put on maybe on a boat or on a plane. It traveled over here, it went to a store, somebody bought it, I found it in a garage sale, I kept it through many years, and now yeah. it is here, right? Yeah. I could talk about where it came from all the way to the point of where it is now. And then... Um, and then the, the, the last question is, what is it for? Where this is, uh, since, since it's man-made, I know that it's a chess piece and is used for the game of chess. And it's the piece of rook that, were, that moves a certain direction, mm-hmm. you know, um, vertical or horizontal, uh, throughout the board. So now that I could answer those questions, I know what the thing is. N- now I begin to understand its actual state of being. Now, there's also things that this can potentially be Mm -hmm. I could this could potentially be all red I could take a spray can and just um, spray paint and just paint it red I could put spikes on this and throw it in people's face and make it a weapon (laughs) right I mean there's so many things I could do with that I could just like crush this you got a freaking shriek man (laughs) (laughs) yes yes you know (laughs) just just let it tint it oh bleached anyway (laughs) That's the fucking word I was thinking of. Get yes. a sun bleached. And so there, there are many things that this could potentially be. Yeah. But in order for it to potentially be that, there has to be some qualities that, that is actually existing in this object for it to be potentially that. Mm-hmm. It cannot be potentially anything. This cannot be potentially a dog. It cannot be potentially a human. It could only be potentially what's within its nature, what's, what's within yeah. its actual state of being. And so he says, cha- so change is not the transference of being to non-being or vice versa. Change is actually the actualization of a potential mm-hmm. already inherent actually in the object. Mm-hmm. And that's all that change is. It's a radical redefinition. It's a radical redefinition, right? And so if that is the case, then we can actually begin to comprehend change. How do we comprehend change? We comprehend its actual state of being. Once we comprehend its actual state of being, we could comprehend what it could potentially be, we can manipulate it to be such. So change is not an illusion, change is merely a, um, an actualization of a potential. And I think that's where I want to leave this class off. And I mean, do you have any comments? No, that no, or? no, no, no. I think we've talked about this four or five times now. Yes, yeah. Per <laughs> week. So. Yes, yes. All right. So, yeah. um, so for the students, I want you to read uh, the chapter for Socrates um, and then get into the beginnings of Aristotle's metaphysics. And um, that's it. All right. All right. Thank you.